Father, we thank you for your faithfulness in our life. God, I'm thankful that we can sing songs that you've never failed us yet and declare that you never will because of your faithfulness. Lord, we thank you that today is the day that you have made, and God, we rejoice. We make a a joyful noise unto you because you're worthy, God. You're worthy. Father, I'm thankful that as we transition into your word, oh God, the, the bread of life, Lord, I pray that our hearts would be prepared and open and willing to receive, and not just receive, but to put into action what you have for us today. In Jesus' name, I declare it. And everybody says, amen and amen. Y'all can be seated this morning if you can. Welcome to the Hill Church. Glad that you're here. Welcome online and Stockton and everybody that's joining in with us today. It's a good day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. Man, we are in this let's get practical. um, Or let's get, sorry, let's get practical last year. Let's get personal this year. Um, uh, We are in this new season where we are uh, talking about this personal devotion to God and, and, and really taking this, uh, this perspective of, of life is not just ebbs and flows of, of how we live with God, but it is a, it's a personal interaction that we are responsible for jumping into all that God has. It's not just uh, going to fall in your lap. There's some personal responsibility to digging into all that God has for you. And so uh, we're going to continue in that today. But today is special. We have some uh, guests with us, and uh, uh, Pastor uh, Pastor Jess and Brenda uh, Strickland, and uh, I, I'm excited about them. And, and I said it in the first service, and since we're live, and I said I would say it publicly, I should say it again so that I'm not a liar. But I, I just um, we we as the Hill, we have an opportunity. I don't know if you've ever met Pastor Bo, the lead pastor of the Hill. He has this unique spiritual gifting to meet people. Uh, that is uncanny that I've ever met before. And uh, a lot of things that we do and see are a result of that. Um, but we were in a conference the other day in, in Oregon, four or 5,000 people there. And randomly someone's like, hey, are you, are you Pastor Bo? And I was like, man, come on. This is crap. I just want to go eat lunch. You know, I can't go anywhere without him, without meeting somebody. Uh, but, but one of those journeys was when we got to meet you guys. And uh, for me, just personally, I, I get to host and see and, and do a lot with all of those people. And these are some of the most genuine, honest, hard after Jesus and people to see Jesus that I've ever met. And uh, it's, a, it's a paired thing. And I got to be careful when I say this. But uh, uh, sometimes, well... Sometimes uh, one portion is, is one way and then the wife is a diva and it's like, you know, I just got to put up with it and go on, but, but not you. And I appreciate you are so fun and you are so just vibrant with life for Jesus. And I, I, I truly appreciate you guys. And so uh, it's an honor to have them here today. Um, really quickly, I took up all my intro time there, but um, Jess and Brenda Strickland, they're, they're lead pastors at Living Hope uh, in, in Aloha, Oregon. Doesn't that sound like a nice tropical place to be? Um, uh, uh, they are, they're just passionate about leading people to Jesus. Uh, they're authors. Uh, he's, he's a proliferant author. Um, they, they have uh, children that uh, he can tell you uh, more about, but um, fantastic people that are going to bring our word today. And would you just stand with me and welcome Pastors Jess and Brenda to the stage. Thank you much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, there is a church. There in Stockton, it's a city upon a hill. And there's a church gathered here in Bolivar. It's shining bright and will remain still. There's some people being battered in Stockton. There's some hearts overwhelmed with dark clouds but there is a Jesus who sees you in the night time 
and reaches out his hand brings you to life he will not forget you in the shadows he'll not neglect you when life is at its worst He'll not disown you when you've gotten a little too close to sin. He will not forsake you no matter what the cost. For you there in Stockton let your hearts arise. Let your spirits be overwhelmed with surprise. Jesus will enter those dark portals and places. He's going to bring you brand new life. And there's a few here in Bolivar waiting on promises to be fulfilled open up your hearts and your lives let him thrill you with things that you have never seen before in places you never knew he could go. He's touching hearts you thought were lost so long ago. Reaching down the hand of heaven Sing awake, my child, come forth. For those who feel they're in the tomb of darkness, for those who feel like they're in the pit of misery, He's coming this morning to shine upon you. He's coming to set you free. He's coming to put God's witness among you. He's coming to put his witness in your words and set you free. So in Stockton and in Bolivar, every person gathered there, we lift our hands to you and say, Jesus, I'm here. Speak and send me. Speak and send me. Me speak and send me. In Jesus' name I pray. The faithfulness, the steadfast love of God. For many of you, Stockton, Bolivar, those watching in other places, God is going to come and show you a side of himself this year you have not seen get ready to increase greatly get ready for your spirit to be enlarged get ready for a connection between you and God to be as it has never been before and get ready for God to make of you a fruitful life that you never imagined he could make get ready Get ready with all of your heart. Get ready with all of your spirit. Get ready with all of your mind. For he is coming. He is coming. He is coming.
and he will do what no man could ever imagine doing. So reign upon this church called the hill. Here we go. Because the church called that hill is reminded of that hill on which our Savior died and buried us and raised us in him so he could give us life. Give life this morning. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Just keep coming here, if you would, just a little bit. So good to be here this morning. I mean, it's always a delight to be in this place. Reminds me of what used to be where I lived. And I do believe, I think I said this last time I was here somewhere, uh, rural America is so important to the rest of our nation because when you live in cities like we do, we, we have too much time on our hands. We don't work hard enough. And so we can sit around and think like Descartes and, and uh, uh, other thinkers, Rousseau, other thinkers. We, we can sit around and say, I wonder who I am. And all of a sudden, a man can think he's a girl, all against science. He can say, I, th I think even though my chromosomes and my science is telling me I'm a man, I think I'm a girl. That's what we do in the city. Maybe do a little bit here, but we really do in the city. We're sitting around with too much time on our hands, and we're trying to make an identity and forge an identity and figure out who we are. There's only one who can give you an identity, and his name is Jesus. And sometimes you get out here in the rural areas, and you guys just, sometimes you work too hard, and that's... That's good that you work a little bit, at least you work some, because sometimes if you're just sitting around thinking about how you can play and how you can enjoy your life and, and you've done everything there is to do, so you'll just start saying, let's start thinking about doing something else. What about this? What about this crazy thing? And then insane things go on. I don't say that insane things don't go on here, but there is just like, you get out into the rural areas and like, I was just watching families leave today. And I, I know this happens here, but it is a rare thing in the city in a church to find a mom and a dad who had children that are all still together. It's a really a rare thing to find. It's a precious thing to find. So here I am here and I feel like I'm, I feel like number one, I'm, I'm home again. And I feel uh, number two, like it's places like this that are so important to the future because here's what's going to happen. There's so many things that are not working in so many places. We just think, well, it's going to get worse and worse and worse and worse. I, I think a little bit different. There's a witness. It's called a church. And I'll tell you, when the land is falling apart, the first thing people are going to do is look around and say, I wonder if it's working anywhere. And they will come to some people that it's working in and say, why is it different with you? And you are some of that group of people who say, why is it different with you? There's a guy over here, just at, you're in kind of a gray, you have, it looks like your two children sitting beside you. Yeah, you just look down, your, your wife's over there, especially for you. Lord's going to visit, I believe, your family this year. I just, I see him taking a door and opening for you, a door that maybe you did not expect to be opened. And you're going to walk through this door and it's going to cr cause your life to increase and you're going to be thankful for it. But more than this, the Lord is wanting to open a door to you because he's wanting to show you a different side of him that you have not seen. It's not that you haven't seen something because like you've been bad, anything like that. It's because it's time for him to show you something really different as a family. It's gonna shake you not in the bad sense. It's gonna shake you in the sense of awe. Oh God, we are realizing you're wanting us to step into something different. And so I just pray that your heart should be open to whatever that door is that he's going to open and bring you close to himself and then give you opportunities that you did not imagine sitting right here at the beginning of 2023, that opportunities that are going to open to you by the end uh, of the year. Just felt that for you. This little girl, I'm sorry, not little girl, but this girl right here in the red, I'm kind of looking right through you. You, uh, you know who you are. I just have this, just this thought for you. What was true of yesterday will not be true about tomorrow the like 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 the things that were low places in yesterday God has this way to kind of level down the high things and bring up the low things that's what God is going to do for you he's going to bring a a a bringing up of the low things and not bringing down of the high things like you won't have any highs but he's going to just put you on that increase and that increase and increase and I, this is just what I saw in your life when I looked over you that the Lord is going to go back 
He's going to clean up some neat things. Like, like, you don't have master sin in your life. I'm not talking about that. But there's going to be some things that have been kind of hurtful or down points in your life. He's going to come in this year and he's going to clean those up. And he's going to set you on a steadier course than you've ever had uh, in your life. He's going to be near you and close to you. And I actually think maybe there is a, a prayer or a longing that's in your heart that comes from him. And I believe that this year he's going to start bringing that longing to fulfillment. You're going to be really surprised. You're, you're, a, you're a cherished daughter of his in Jesus' name. Uh, if I go too long at this, I won't stop and I won't get into preaching. And so I probably better stop except for one more. Get, get ready, the two of you, to be radically touched by God this year. You're going to be radically touched by God and you're going to find that people are going to come to you. They come to you for service. And they come to you for strength in many ways, but they are going to uh, come to you and I get your relationship in the sense of this, would this be who to you? That's, that's what I was thinking. So I, I want you to realize I knew that I knew that. But he's going to be coming to both of you in your generation. He is going to be coming to you to bring you close. And both of you in an unusual, because you're servants, people though in the future are going to come to you and say, how do we know God? How do we get close to God? Because there's a real tenderness he's going to bring to the both of you. And you're going to help people get close to God because what's coming in the future it's going to require people be really really near God and both of you are going to have a unique quest in that even with what's going on in your church right now what you're going to learn to do that's just going to get deeper and deeper and deeper and they're going to come and say tell us how to know God because when you know and walk with God when you're out there in the crazy world and it's all coming apart and going nuts when you're close to God you just ask him one question what should I do and he gets you right there when you're with somebody that needs to know Jesus, you just say, what do I need to say or do right now? And he gives you the right thing to say. This is why we want to know him and we want to walk with him because there are answers that we cannot get on our own that we can get with him. And both of you in your unique generation are going to be that to people. They're going to come to you uniquely and say, help us learn how. One of the, by the way, if you're 60, 55, 60 and older, uh, if you're in here today and you'd be very important if you're in here, because guess what? You cannot have vision without dreams and you can't dream without visions, meaning you need both kind of older and younger. In our church, some of our most prized people are older people. In fact, younger people go to their Bible studies because they want to hear the older people talk about how do you connect with God? How, how do you do this thing? And so if you're in the 60s, be careful. Don't preach to them. Just tell them your, just give them your experience. Don't tell them what they should do. Just give them your experience. And God does a wonderful thing of opening himself up to the church and revealing himself. Wow, thank you very much. Do you have a song you want to sing? Go ahead. Let's take let's take a few minutes. I want to hear you sing just the song of the Lord.
a while. Thank you guys very much. That was excellent. Thank you for playing for me a little extra. Thank you. Worship was so excellent today. Love Pastor Clinton, wife. What a great place. Pastor Bo, Megan. This is just like, it's a wonderful thing going on here. Stockton, so glad uh, you're with us, those online. So glad that you're here. And uh, we're going to do this thing where you're there, I'm here, and going to try to remember you while I'm preaching this group. But i got to tell you, this group is pretty lively, so they grab my attention in a real good way. But so glad you were there. Love the hill. Just love everything about this place. So let's uh, jump into the Word. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, is that included in your preaching time? Are we going to go over this? I know you're thinking that. I, I, I get it. I get it. I don't know. <laughs> Like, at my age, I mean, I care about, you know, I don't care about being invited back. I just care about doing a good enough job <laughs> where they'd want to have me back. But part of me at the same time says, shoot, at my age, I could be dead. So just go for it, you know. So <laughs> who knows what I have to, I am not, hey, listen, I am not going to hold you long. But I may go just a little tiny bit over uh, if, you don't, if you don't mind. So, yeah, no, yeah. Yeah, you know, <laughs> I got to tell you something. Somebody says to me this all the time. They said, like, don't watch the time. Just go for it. And then I think, I really like that when I'm preaching. But when somebody else is preaching, I'm not always thinking that. Like, my wife is not thinking that. <laughs> like, she'll hold up the red card here in a moment. Say, Would you just stop? Okay. We'll go a few minutes. I, I think you'll like this. I think uh, it'll be helpful. Uh, <laughs> I one time was dreaming. I was sitting in a chair in my auditorium and I went up to the platform and I was asked by the Lord how many people knew to he how many people in the church I was pastoring knew how to hear his voice and uh, really you know I don't I, I, I couldn't answer and the reason I can't answer is because how my brain was structured to get people saved to get people saved means to get them believing in Jesus and accepting Jesus into your heart that's kind of the like, I'm going to say something. I'm going to drop this bomb in here. And then I love what this young girl did. She come and asked me to explain something. So I drop bombs and then I leave. Okay. <laughs> so the evangelical center of who we are has been believe in Jesus, accept him in your heart. And we kind of somehow think that's the message of the Bible because we haven't understood the story. That would be kind of, and that's, that's kind of where I was. We like, like we think deliverance from sin means getting forgiveness for, to, for sins so we can go to heaven. It really kind of has our world walk when we, we realize that is kind of a, a, a Platonist concept heaven and it was never really introduced by Jesus anyway. You know, Matthew McConaughey says, well, you know, I'm just dreaming of my dad up there or whoever it was, you know, ha having a bud and eating a uh, gumbo. Well, if I could just say this, it would be impossible for him to be holding a bud and eating some gumbo because he needs a body. And so you cannot have life without a body. You need a body. The promise of Jesus was resurrection and a new heaven and a new earth. Where are you headed to heaven? No, you're headed to earth, a new heaven and a new earth. God is trying to get this whole place straightened out. He created a physical universe and he wants it to endure on and on and on forever. This is the game he's playing. He's not trying to get you into heaven. He doesn't have some Greek thing or some Western thought of heaven for you that he wants you and me in. He wants you in the new heavens and the new earth and he wants us with King Jesus reigning and all justice and all ju uh, love working. He wants us back here ruling and reigning on a planet that will go on forever. He wants the physical world to be kind of an immortal place. We know that this can happen because the very body of Jesus Christ was raised from the dead and he was given immortal DNA. And from that immortal DNA, he wants to create an entire world. So I was thinking all this in my dream. I was not. <laughs> what I was thinking when he was asking me, like how many people know to hear my voice, I'm just thinking my job is to get people to believe you and accept you into their heart. And what happened were these lights came down on people's heads and I noticed that they were only setting on about 12 to 20 people. Wasn't very many lights in, in uh, our auditorium. And uh, I woke up from the dream and uh, I s sat down. And as I'm sitting down, this, actually the verse, what actually happened, this verse came to me. It was, uh, depart from me, you never knew me. That was the verse that came into my mind when I woke up. Depart from me, you never knew me. And then I felt like the Lord said this in my spirit. If they cannot hear my voice, they do not know me. 
and you are telling them that they are saved. And I said, whoa. I said, because now this is kind of like a kind of a hit. So, so Jesus is telling people that believe in him, he is, he is saying, depart from me because I never knew you. These are believers. These are good, old-fashioned, evangelical believers that he's saying, depart from me. And Jesus is telling me, what I'm wanting is I'm wanting people to be able to hear my voice. My sheep know my voice, and no one can take them out of my hand. I, I say it this way. My daughter laughs when I say this. I say, if you have faith to believe in God, God, you don't even have good, wholesome, demonic faith yet. If you have faith that believes in God, you like get up to demonic faith. What's demonic faith? Okay. Oh, you don't get, excuse me, you don't even get up to demonic faith. What is demonic faith? Demonic faith is, James says, the devil believes oh, and shudders. We can believe in God without even shuddering. We can't even get up to a demonic level of faith. Because this is what faith really is. When the word pistis is used in the New Testament, we in our Western world have interpreted that to be, see, you help me, gal, asking me this question, because I want to explain it real good. We have used, what is your name, by the way? Cadence. Cadence? Well, you asked me such a good question. You have, you have moved me a different direction for, for a moment anyway. When that word pistis, which is the word for faith in the Bible is used, 75% of the time it doesn't mean what you think. It doesn't mean to believe real hard. It doesn't mean to believe with steroids. It doesn't mean to believe with strength. What it means is to give your allegiance to another. That, that, that's really what it believes. So what I was telling her you can't do that without the Holy Spirit. You can't say Jesus is Lord. Because when you say, Jesus, you are my Lord. I am renouncing all other lords, including me. I renounce me as the ruler and the boss of my life. And I am giving my entire life to you. 75% of the time, that word, in fact, most of the time, they've done works on this that, the, the faith, it was, a woman did, a, I mean, pages on this, faith in the Roman and Christian world. And what she did is she went back and she looked how that word was used in the time of Jesus and during that culture. And it was a security word. It'd be like this. It's like, like if you went and bought a piece of land, you would, like, you, you, would, you would give somebody your piece this. You would give somebody your surety. If I don't make the payments on this land, you can come and take my life. It'd be that kind of thing. It would be like when a soldier would swear their allegiance to you know, a general or particularly the emperor. What are they doing there? It's a, it's, it's a kingdom word. They were giving allegiance to someone else. And so what Jesus is wanting to do of you this morning, does he want you to believe? Like how we would use that word? Yes, that word is, it's acceptable to use that way because James is explaining that, the kind of believing that the devil had, but he shuddered. Why? He shuddered, shudders because he knows who God is. He knows that Christ has been given all authority over the world and his days are numbered. And remember when Jesus said, like, don't worry about them that can, like, you know, make fun of you and, and abuse you. And do that. Worry about him who has the last and the final say over your soul. And so when we are coming before Jesus and giving him our allegiance, it should not only just be, I believe in you. I am giving you my heart and there's a shuddering in me because I realize one day I will stand before you and you will look at my entire soul. And I don't know why I, I thought this, but when he looks at our entire soul, he won't look at us and say, oh, you know what? You believed really, really hard. That's what I was looking for. That's not what he's going to assess us on. That's why James says you cannot separate faith from works. He was simply saying this. He's, he, when you come before him, he's looking at you and, and he'll say, and we'll all do this incredibly imperfectly. We're not even going to get this close to being right. But here's the thing. When he says, think about it this way. You say it this way. He says, when you take faith the size of a mustard seed. So let's do it this way. If you take allegiance that is hardly there and you plant it 
it grows an incredible bush. This is not about, I want great faith. I just would like a must, I would just like a fleck of allegiance to get in my heart. You know why? Because a little piece of allegiance before Jesus has a powerful effect before God. He knows your trials. He knows your temptations. He knows all that's going on in your life. Yeah. So, when, in fact, I'm going, to just, I'm going to go to the end here right now is what I'm going to do. So when you go to the Lord's Prayer, you just go to the Lord's Prayer, and, and the first word, Hebrew word, the first word from that Lord's Prayer is Evinu, which means our Father. So we go to our Father, which art in heaven, and then you have that in the first slide, you have that, 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 that word there, hallowed be thy name. Now most of us, we're charismatic, so guess what we don't need? We don't need to say stuff over and over again. We don't need liturgy. We don't need ritual. We have prophecy. We have fresh songs. We have spontaneous things. We have inspiration. We have all kinds of stuff. Guess what we don't need? We don't need liturgy. So the last thing you ever want to do is pray the Lord's Prayer two days in a row. Get some Holy Spirit in you and get you another prayer for heaven's sakes. Do you know, I start, I don't know how long I've done it. I don't know how long me and my wife have done it. I don't know how long our church has done it. Do you know most, almost everybody in our church starts every day with the Lord's Prayer? We start every day. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Because there's not a good English word for hallowed. Timothy Keller says the best, probably, English equivalent we have to hallowed is ultimate. So here we go. Sometimes I walk in on my wife. And here she is, foot of her bed. She rolls out of bed, and here she is, just like this. And I know what she's doing. Our Father in heaven, ultimate be your name. Your name is ahead of and before and ultimate to any other name, including my name. Your name is ultimate to every name of sickness that might be going on in our church. Your name is ultimate to every sin that's trying to encounter and getting in my life. Your name is ultimate to everything. And before your name, I surrender my life. Now, let me say this if, if I could. We hold the bread up on Sunday morning in our church. It makes me weep when we do it. We hold the bread up and we say, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. So should you be doing that? Yeah. Jesus said, this is my body. It's not an emblem. It's not a sign. It's not a symbol. It's his body. It's important for you to learn this. So when you're partaking the bread, you are feeding on the sacrifice life of Jesus. It's the only sacrifice we have in the church. God got rid of the rest of them, and what he did is he went to the table of the Lord, and he gives us this bread, and, he, and he's saying, uh, my, the presence of Calvary is with you as you partake of this. I am giving you my whole self. And you take that and eat that, and you're partaking of the sacrifice life of Jesus. As you partake of that life, you're supposed to do this in return. This is what goes on here. You got me. You got me, Jesus. You're my Lord. You are my savior, you are my boss, you have my faith, my fidelity, my allegiance, you have everything in me. That's what's supposed to go on there. When, when we say, this is the blood in the new covenant, we are drinking his blood. Now, is it like, does, is it transubstantiate? Does it actually become his flesh and his blood? No. Somebody's at a wedding the other day and they dropped some bread and they got all concerned about it. It's okay. What goes into your mouth is what's blessed. Don't worry about the crumbs you put on the floor. It's what goes into your mouth. Don't worry about what, go, what goes in your mouth. This is the very blood of Jesus. It's not transubstantiated. In other words, Jesus is in the blood as though it was flowing out of his side from Calvary into your very being. Because it's feeding something else. You got baptized. Get into the waters. We do it this way. Jesus said... Okay, and I know I'm probably rocking your world, but again, I'm of that age, so no filters. We get in the waters and we say, at home, we say this. We baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, what is that name? Father, Son, Holy Spirit, those are titles. 
descriptions. What is the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit? We go through the book of Acts, you see how they baptize. They baptize in the name of Jesus, the Lord Jesus. We baptize you into the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So our formula works like this. We baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, of the Holy Spirit. We baptize you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why do we do that? Because the water becomes liquid Jesus. Just like the bread becomes his body and the cup becomes his blood, the, the liquid itself becomes Jesus Christ. And when you go under, say, well, like, it's literally Jesus. No, but his presence is in the water as though you were going into his death and coming out of his death into his resurrection. Does that make sense, everybody? Just trying to make sense of this prayer. Our Father, Avinu, who art in heaven, ultimate, be your name. I give my life to you. Here it comes. Yahweh! Where's God? I don't know. Prophet said, He's near you, even in your mouth. Yahweh! Jesus! He's in the bread, He's in the cup, He's in the water. He is in the mention of his name. Yes. That's why everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Yes. Jesus. You see, when we call upon his name, Lord Jesus, I give you my heart. I give you me, even if it's in like my own, the most insipid, weak, horrible amount of faith you have to muster up and say, oh God, I renounce me and I give me you. And you call on his name. He's present right there. And he can do things with your life that is absolutely beyond imagination. We pray the Lord's Prayer, Our Father. There's no personal pronouns at all in that prayer. Because if you don't pray the prayer right, it leads you right back to feeling good. Does God want you to feel good? Of course he wants you to feel good, not first. My goal is not to do prayer to feel good. My goal is to do prayer to give my heart to God. Now, the Lord's Prayer isn't something that we repetitiously do every day. It's something that gives us bullet lines. Like, here's a topic of prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Next verse, verse 10. Here's another part of that prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. When I'm praying thy kingdom come, I start going to work on our church. Oh, God. The church needs your kingdom. We need to, we need to act as your kingdom people. I'll, I'll kind of go off like that. And then sometimes when I get into the will, I said, God, I need your will. Now, now I make it personal. Sometimes I make that, that, all that prayer up, but it has all kinds of things. So it just becomes a bullet point. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. I never pray for my own money first, ever. Why? Because I'm in a body. Here's, here's what's significant about what you've got going on here. What's so wonderful. You guys need to put the clock back up there for me. I am watching it a little bit. Um, where was I at? What was I just saying? <laughs> just hit because I didn't know where I was time-wise. I'm so used to time. Here's what you here. here's what's going on here. What did I say right before that? Oh! Yeah, yeah, it's not your money. Yeah, thank you very much. It's not your money first. That really starts your Sure, because I have to be accountable to Bo later. And he's really a nice guy, but I don't know what you do like if you go too long. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to manage this a little bit. Anyway, so it's not your money. So, so what I do first is I pray for the church, the health of the church's money first, and then I go to mine. And it's a very interesting thing. My prayer for my money is really short. Why? Because if the church is doing well and prospering, I'm probably going to do okay and get a raise. Like, are you hearing me? Like, whoever you work for, I'd be praying for them. Oh, God, give bread to my boss. Well, what if you run your own business? Oh, God, give bread to my customers. Oh, Lord, would you prosper them today? Can you see how that will take you into otherness before it takes you into me? And by the time you get to me, you know, by the time I get to me praying for my bread, I say, thank you for what you're doing in the church, Jesus. 
And uh, I just pray you'd remember me as you're blessing them. Amen. And then I'm off to something else. Forgive us. See, these are all headlines. Forgive us. God, would you make Living Hope a forgiving community? So I wouldn't start by praying, oh God, forgive me. I would start by praying, make the hill a forgiving group of people. Make, make us a people that receives your forgiveness and asks for your forgiveness and, and, and confesses our sins. You know, why, you know why people sin so much? Because they don't confess their desires. That's why they sin so much. Go to work. There's a little gal that works there. She starts catching my eye. Why does she catch my eye? Because I don't love my wife? No, not because you don't love your wife. Because we are wired to live from our own desires, not to live attached to God. So she catches your eyes. So you go to group and you're going to be handed this a little bit later. It's going to be explained and this is going to be very important to you. And you may not understand it all today, but kind of hang with it. It's going to make sense. So you go to group and, and they say, how's the week been going for you? Oh, really, really good. In the back of your mind is the girl that caught your notice. All she did was catch your notice. She, you know, all you said was, she looks good. I like looking at her. I like being around her. She makes me feel a certain way. Whatever, whatever you're saying about her. All of a sudden, you know, so next week you come back and now ah, looking has gone to flirting. Mild flirting. Just see how it goes. These take time, take things, these time, these things take time to build. Then we go back to a group the next week. Haven't written anything down. We're not talking about anything. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Like in our, when I get on, uh, get on our men's group stuff or I attend a men's group thing, here's what I hear men say. Uh, somebody caught my eye at work. I'm a little bit concerned about it. Oh, really? And they jump right into prayer. No one has sinned yet. A guy has just noticed somebody at, at work. Now, here's the thing that I, I don't understand. Girls don't ever notice any guy at work. And yet it always takes a guy and a girl to do things they shouldn't do. But I know a girl would never look back at a guy. So I know, ladies, you don't have this problem at all. It's zero in you. So I know I'm just talking to the men right now. Because I don't know how it happens that a girl gets involved. But I know she wouldn't do this back. Are you hearing what I'm saying? If you would confess your desires, you wouldn't have to be talking about, hey, three months ago. Are, are you hearing me? And I'm just trying to use, I'm just trying to use a big one. Are your, I saw a guy who had his one-year coin. Like, he comes to a group and he says, you know what? I'm starting to drive by my old bar again. I haven't gone in, but I notice on the way home I'm driving by the old place I like to, like to haunt. I like to pick up my liquor. I'm, I'm going by that place again. And when you begin to confess that, all, you guys, <laughs> I am praying that living hope becomes a place where people confess their stuff early so there isn't damage later on. This should become a, and then if we do have, uh-oh, uh-oh, you might be sitting here today and say, I've taken a step over where I shouldn't be. Well, then get to a pastor and talk about it. Jesus died on the cross to get you out of wherever you're at. So there is still hope. You can still get your life rebuilt. And then I pray, God, make us a place that confesses. And then I usually right there, I'll start confessing my stuff. Or then, Lord, make us a place that forgives. So that becomes, we're a people that it's easy to ask forgiveness. Is that making sense? And then lead us. Or you notice it's always us first. God, would you please keep us on the path of fidelity as a church? Would you keep us that way? Keep us from the evil one. Evil to me is anything that takes my attachment and my allegiance away from God. I pray that for the church and then for the... Is that making sense? So when I start on my knees and I say hallowed be your name and my life belongs to you Lord Jesus I am counting on him being there the way he's in the bread and the cup and the waters of baptism it's a very sacred thing I can't just use his name it's when I am directing my my heart to call on him as the Lord of my life is that making sense to you okay I have two other things I can tell you or I could quit right there. What would you like? Keep going. Okay. Five of you said keep going. The other thousand said stop. So I'll keep going. I'll keep going for the few. <laughs> okay. This won't take long. So that's just pray. And pray around us. And pray surrender your life to Jesus. And then those are just bullet point outlines that you can use. And, and by the way, say I don't have like a lot of time to pray. Do you know like when we're traveling and we don't have time to pray, we'll at least get on our knees and pray the first line 
And then sometimes maybe I'll pray the fifth line because I'm just sensing that there's something there like, like today, God, keep us out of trial, keep us out of harm's way. Does that make sense? So it's really a great prayer because you can just kind of choose the topics out of there. Okay, number two. And I know, say, praying the Lord's Prayer every day, that's going to get so boring. Okay, pray it until you get bored. And then keep praying it. So when can we quit praying it? When you never want to quit praying it ever again, that's when you've mastered it. Does that make sense to you? Guy goes to AA in our church, been going for 40 years, every day for 40 years. I said, have you, like, have you been clean that? He said, I've been clean the whole time. I said, how long are you going to keep going? He said, the rest of my life. I said, well, how long are you supposed to be going to AA? He said, well, you're supposed to go until you don't need to go anymore. R, R. He said, you go, <laughs> you go until you never want to quit going. That's the Lord's prayer. He goes because he never wants to quit going because his being there helps people come to Christ. I pray the Lord's prayer because it is a sure way to help me. Know it's, it, the Lord's prayer doesn't do it. It's a tool Jesus gave me to know that I'm reminding myself I'm coming before Jesus and here are the critical topics. Okay, number two, this, this rest of it goes very fast, is the examine. Okay, the examine is a very simple thing. You can read on it and Google it and all that and, and there are piles of material on it, but it's just really doing two simple things in prayer. Um, by the way, if you're asking me, Jess, how long does it take you to pray the Lord's Prayer? I'm probably on it five minutes a day, five to seven. That's how I start my morning. I'm not trying to do a religious thing with it. I have prayed the Lord's Prayer longer, but in my daily habit, because there are things that I believe the Lord wants me to go through. So this is not like you're trying to spend a lot of time at it. The second thing is the examine. I usually, sometimes I'll do this in the morning, maybe once every six or seven days, but I usually try to do it in the afternoon and in the evening. It's a very simple thing. You just, you, you know, the, the Bible verse that says, search me, O God, and know my heart. The verse that says that. What you're doing is you're letting God search you, and you're asking two questions of God. And these are very important questions. Number one, where have you been in my life today? Like, where have, I, where have I seen you? I was telling people this morning, I was asking this last night, and I, I had some things. And this morning when I got into the car, I was just thinking about just some th travel things that have just not gone right for us. Usually things just, you know, go really, really, really good for us. But there's just this, that, and the other thing hadn't gone right. And I'm reaching out, I'm taking my door, and I'm pulling it shut. And as I'm pulling my door shut, I... I, I I felt like the Lord began to talk to me about, hey, did you see all the gift that I gave you to help you with your grumbling? It's like, oh, all this stuff you've been setting up so you could show how much grumbling is in your, my heart. I want to confess, I'm not doing well. Wife is doing fine, I'm not doing well. I was like, I got, re got really just bothered with somebody and it like took me, I was having to go up three to four times before I could smile and say, hey, how you doing and be pleasant to them. And, and, but I realized this morning that was God's gift to me to show me my heart. Is that making sense? Yeah. And so you're asking God, God, sh and so sometimes when he's showing you where he's been at, like it's, like I was trying to help you with this. That was help. And you realize, of course that's help. Wonderful help. And then other times he's just showing you, I did, I was there, there, I was there, there, I was there, there. And you say, thank you, Jesus. But the second question you ask, where were you? The second question you ask, and by the way, if you do this more than five minutes a day, you will get into self-flagellation and beating up on yourself or excuse. Don't do it. Just take five minutes a day. And how many of you know you've probably sinned about 12 times before you ever got here? Well, okay. Six. How many of you, a, a, a sin basically, it, it, it says this, what is not of allegiance, what, of, what is not of fidelity, but what is of desire, living for my desire, that would be sin. How many of you, just, just do this for me. I'm just like, I'm a guest, just, you're going to hate this, but raise your hand if you've sinned once in the last week. Like, let's, let's like this. Not like this, it's like this. Like elbow, like I have. Okay, now keep your hands up as I go through this. Get hands up, so we're just going to test this. How many of you have sinned twice in the last seven days? Three times. Uh, four times, five times. Okay, now keep, keep your hands up. Here's the next question. So you leave your hand up unless this speaks of you. How many of you 
have confessed those sins to someone else. Okay, so my, just, my guess is here. I, I think, do you think maybe confession of sin is missing in the church just a little bit? Just like, just, just, just a tiny bit. Said, so you do this at home, I do it at home. I did it last week. That's why I'm here this week. <laughs> so I got in trouble, so, so I'm here this week. No, yeah, I, I do that at home, but, but we, we hardly confess sins anymore because we're hardly aware of it. Could I just say this? There's more sinning going on in your life than you care to know. And this is the good news. There's more sinning going on in your life than Jesus cares to reveal to you. If he were to share with you all of your sin, you would be like, ah, kill me. I'm not worth living. You should have made me a giraffe or something. I don't know. But I'm, he, it would just destroy you. So what you, do, you don't spend a lot of time on this. The Holy Spirit's very good at this. Lord, like, show me where I was self-centered. Show me where I was sinful, you know, today or in the last few hours. Just show that to me, and then he'll show something to you. Like, why did he choose that? I don't know. Here's what I think. I think because he knows you can handle that. There's bigger things he can show me yet. I've been doing this a long time. There's bigger things he can show me. He takes me. It's, it's not like he's trying to get us perfect. He's trying to get us perfectly faithful. What is it to be perfectly faithful? We keep coming back every day and saying, I'm yours. I'm yours. I, I love that passage. Though you sin seven times 70, come back and you're saying, I'm yours. He takes you back. That's what that verse is about. And so it's not about getting perfect. It's about all the time just coming back and saying, oh God, here I am again. I'm yours. And an examine. Jesus, this is where you're at. Thank you so much for being there. What have I been doing that, like, you know, has been a little bit sinful? Well, just this thing right here. Thank you, Lord. Help me clean that up. Do I need to talk to anybody? Help me clean that up. That making sense? That's, that's an yeah. examine. Yeah. Don't do it long. If you do it long, what will start happening is you'll start condemning yourself. That's not the goal here. And if you start condemning yourself, you're thinking about your own sins. It's not the Holy Spirit. Here's what he'll do. He will convict you and love you at the same time. It's a bittersweet thing and it happens. Oh, oh God, yes, that's true. Oh, wow. Thank you, Jesus, for loving me and telling me that. And then the last thing here that I have written down for you is reading. Okay, so this, I'll explain later. Our church reads the same passages of Scripture together. Our church, this is, and we've been working on this for 20 years, it's elaborate. I hate that, I don't even want to tell you this, but I want to just explain to you how strong we're into this. Because if I say this, you might think, I'm not in, I don't think, like the way our church does something is not the way anybody else should do it. It's just the way we should do it. But in telling you how we do things, it will show you the importance to our church. So what we did is we wanted to get everybody reading together. And then we think the purpose of reading together is to get insight. That, that's, that, that's the first thing that happens to you. So what I did, because people are getting weird insights, I went back and I wrote a Bible review on every single verse in the Bible. So if you go on our website, it will say, here's the Bible reading for the day. And then you can punch another thing. You guys, I'm not telling, no other church in the world should do this. This is how I pastor. Everybody's a pastor differently. You can punch on another button and it will bring up an explanation of what those verses mean so people don't get too crazy with their thoughts and their ideas about what the Bible means so they don't get far out insights. That's how we started. We still do that, by the way. Every day you can go there and do that. And and all of that. But we realize the goal of Scripture is not to get insights. That happens naturally. Knowledge puffs up. Insight is another form of knowledge, but love edifies. I did this illustration in the last service. I didn't do it in this, but I cannot remember your name. Ron. Come on up here, Ron. I love this guy. He's a, he's a tender-hearted guy. I don't know what your history is, but you are one tender-hearted guy. Okay, now, okay, just stand right here for a moment, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have you facing me. There was a guy who comes to our church. He can't come all the time uh, because of his work, but he shows up now and again. I happened to be up with Spanish church, uh, working in the Spanish service. I came downstairs, and for some reason I went around by the front door, and he's coming in the front door about 20, 30 minutes late. And so I shove the door open, and I yell at his name. I'm gonna yell at his name here, but I'll yell at a different name. I come through the door and I do it just like this. Jim, you're here! Like that. 
And he comes running over to me. And he says, you have no idea what that means to me. Now listen, we sat there looking in each other's eyes. When you get into Jim Wilder, and guys have done science on this, the only way you can build character is through eye-to-eye -eye contact. Do you know what your character is? Whoever your community is. And part of your community has to be Jesus. So when I'm doing an exam and, Lord, where have you been? I'm listening to you. Where have you been? When I'm doing an exam and where have I strayed? I'm listening to him. That's my ear. It's part of the bonding process. That's part of attachment. Okay. Ron comes into the church. Watch this. Ron comes into the church. We walks into the church and we look into each other's eyes. See, I can tell by looking into his eyes right now, he has a certain level of affection for me. <laughs> well, it can't be deep yet because we don't know each other deeply, but I can tell this would be a guy that I would like in the church. We would spend time talking in church on Sunday, if not beyond that. Like his eyes, I love the tenderness that's there. I love the boldness that's behind that tenderness and that sensitivity. See, you don't realize this, but when you're doing this, you're making this attachment. Let me tell you what he's not going to want to do, and I would not want to do. I mean, this is probably set for life in us. I would not want to do anything unloving or disappointing to him. He's my community. Just this, this little eyeball to eyeball, being sensitive to one another. He's my community. I don't want to harm him. That's, how, that's why church is so important. You start looking in each other's eyes. You're going eyeball to eyeball. And you're starting to say, that's my community. Don't mess with them. I love them. I'm invested in them. You don't grumble. You don't complain. You don't get negative on people. You don't do any of that stuff. You just go eyeball to eyeball. They're my community. And then I come to Jim someday. And I say, Jim, like I, I'm working on a desire right now. It's, it's kind of creeping up in me. And he says, hey, you're forgiven. But let me pray for, for you there. And all of a sudden, when he does that, and he looks at me with those eyes, without judgment, but the love of God, guess what I begin to see? I begin to see a little bit of Jesus' eyes looking at me. And that's why you got to get it going in the church. Thanks, buddy. I love you. You're a good one. Wow. Every Sunday morning, Somebody stands right about here in our church. And they'll say this. Oh, they'll start out like this. Lord, give us the courage to stand where we've never stood before. But then they'll go into the high priestly prayer after they pray two or three of those things. And then here it goes. And everybody is standing there like this. We do it every Sunday. Everyone stand. You, you know what we used to do? People... <sighs> hurry up, oh, they're doing that stupid benediction, get it over with. We stayed with it, 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 and now they stand. If I'm, if I'm moving to the back door because I want to greet some people, and, and I will not leave the room until they start that, and then I stop, and here I go. The Lord bless you, keep you, cause his face to shine upon you. You know what that means? That means may his eyes twinkle at you to let you know that he finds joy being with you. We say that every week. May God shine his eyes upon you and convince you and show you beyond a doubt he finds joy hanging out with you no matter who you are what you've done he likes being with you and saving you and be gracious to you and give you peace when you read the word you're letting it so soak in you that you can even though you cannot see with these eyes his eyes you start seeing with your heart his very eyes. You see him and you can, you can see it in his eyes. He likes being with me. You, 
goodness is following after me. When I sing that song, I see his eyes. Surely, goodness and hased, the deep, not going to give up on you, love of God. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. I read a verse like that. I whoo, he looking at me. When the Holy Spirit's convicting me of sin, I'm looking at you for the Son. I discipline. I love. I'm trying to take care of your son. I had heart problems, you know, season back. And I remember being out walking the road, wondering what's going to happen to me. And God said, this is not happening to you to kill you. It's happening to you to save your life. We read scripture not to get insights. We read scripture until we're hearing and seeing the very eyes of God looking back at us and saying, come on. I find joy in being with you. You don't realize this, but character is developed. They've figured this out in brain science, and man, it works out with the Word of God, that you build character when you look in somebody's eyes and they find joy being with you. That's where character is built. Do you just put your hands like this? You can pray a simple prayer. Lord Jesus, I renounce me, and here I am today giving you my heart. So Jesus, I'm yours. I'm entrusting myself to you in Jesus' name. If you have done that this morning and you've not been baptized, here's what Jesus wants to do. He wants to put you in water. He wants his name declared over that water. Jesus wants to become liquid water to you and he wants to bury you in himself and he wants to bring you up in newness of life. Next time they have a baptism, don't walk, run to the class or whatever you do here. Run to that class and let Jesus begin to show you how deeply he loves you. Bless this church. Bless the church in Stockton, those that are watching. In Jesus' name we pray. Pastor Clinton, thank you so much. This is a great, great, great church. Thank you.